welcome. Uh, this is a really exciting uh, thing for me. Uh, kind of an honor, really, to be talking to James St. James. <laughs> well, no, the honor is all mine. I've been very excited about this because when you told me last week that it's the 15th anniversary of Party Monster, well, it seems like it's yesterday to me. I mean, literally, you and I were walking down the red carpet in, in Tokyo in London, uh -huh. in Scotland, in LA, <laughs> in New York, at Sundance. We really covered the waterfront. Traveling with Macaulay, I remember in Japan especially, there was a scene where we were all getting in the car. It was like something out of the Beatles' Hard Day's Night. It was. Where people were crawling on the car. Everybody yes, had banging on the windows, mm -hmm. flashing their titties, pressing them up. <laughs> yes. You know, one of the one of the challenges of, of Party Monster promoting it was that everyone expected you to be a club kid and to oh. be taking lots of drugs and acting all crazy, right? I mean, <laughs> at the time I was wearing like Prada suits and, and trying to... to, to sell this book, but I really should have, you know, let my club kid freak flag fly. What did you think when you read the script? My problem with the script was just that I didn't understand script writing at the time. Uh -huh. There were things uh, that you realized as, as a filmmaker that couldn't translate from the book onto the film. And I didn't understand that at the time that you, you need to tell a linear story. <laughs> you just loved, sort of hated the way you thought you'd been turned into an English well, queen. No, 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 because when Macaulay, God bless him, and I love his performance, and I think he's absolutely adorable, he's not doing a Michael Ailig impersonation. You can hear that he's doing this sort of crisp uh, accent. I don't know if that you're giving, if you were giving him line reading. Just do it like me, <laughs> No, no, I didn't at all. And, and what did you, what did you think, like, when you saw the film for the first time? Visually, I loved everything about it. I loved Seth's performance. I loved McCauley's performance. I, each and every one of them, Marilyn Manson, every, there's like these oh little onions. God. It's just, it was hard to, conf it was, it's a hard thing to watch yourself up there and it was still very raw. How is it like Seth playing you? My mom went to go see, I told her, I said, don't go see it, mom. You know, I'm smoking crack in a diaper. I mean, there's just, you don't need to see your son like that. She went to go see it opening night anyway. And my mom said he got my laugh down. Uh -huh. And I thought if my mom says it, it, it passes, she knows more than anyone. Well, two things. One is that Seth was the first one in. You know, and really played a huge part in persuading Macaulay to mm -hmm. do to do the film. And the the irony of that is the script was written for Macaulay. Like it was the only person we could see playing the part. <laughs> but, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. but he had completely retired. There was no chance of him playing the part. Once Seth became attached, he made it his mission to get Macaulay, and he I mean he did it. I remember we were at a party at the Chateau Marmont and John Waters was there and we went up to him, we were talking about this, and John Waters said, I have been trying to get Macaulay for five years and he will not do it. You don't have a chance in hell. Uh -huh. And I remember Chloe Seven was there and we were trying to get, talk to Chloe about doing it and she's like I don't know, Michael I don't know, like that and then we ended up getting all of them I don't think Chloe really liked the movie <laughs> well I remember I sat with her at Sundance and I remember seeing her eyes get bigger <laughs> and bigger and her hands tensing up the thing about her is like she can do anything mm -hmm. that the camera just loves. A, Can't she and floats it, off the film I like an old style it, movie star, yes. like Marilyn Monroe, yes. like like Jean Harlow. She just, yeah. Oh, I do remember Seth would call me all the time in the middle of the night while you guys were filming and it'd be like four in the morning. Uh, he'd be like, how do you open a door? And like he would, <laughs> like he really went into like really method acting. Yes. And I remember he said that he and Macaulay would call each other beforehand in the middle of the night and for hours talk as if they were Michael and James. James. You know, for two straight boys, they really lived the... They lived the life. Yeah, the, and the, I, I love them for that so much. The scene that they really, really... I, I mean, I was so surprised, but the scene that they really, really loved doing was we went to Times Square and stole a shot of them walking along the central meridian in Times Square. They were just so excited about that. They really? thought that was like real movie making. And I remember there's a, a story about how um, you were in Harlem, Macaulay had to be smoking a cigarette and so Marilyn Manson taught him how to smoke because Macaulay had never that, smoked before. Yes. He was just so available during the shoot. He would just hang out with everyone and chat to everyone and his interpretation of Christina was magical. <sighs> oh my like, God. Because if you, we both know Christina yes. and that was, he was channeling her from, from below or above or wherever Christina was. She invaded was. his body. He yeah. was a vessel. I realize we're going slightly backwards here in chronology, but when the reviews came out of the movie, what did you think? Um, 
Well, it's interesting because the reviews for the documentary mm. were so over the moon and people I, really went bananas for it. I know where this is going. <laughs> the book, it was very mixed. I remember when the book came out, it got some really, really great reviews. And then other people were saying like, why would you want to spend time with these people? They're just horrible. And then I think by the time the movie came out, that that's where it started tilting <laughs> was that these people are just nightmares and why would we, we want to spend time? And there's no redeeming quality mm. to any of these people. You're seen as the authentic the authentic piece of the whole thing. You know, you wrote the book that the yeah. movie was, was based on. You're in the documentary. I think you have the last word of the documentary. Right, yeah. It is sort of the Rocky Horror for I was a whole just generation. Say, it's like the Rocky Horror picture You know, show, where right? people know every line of dialogue. Right. The one I always hear is... Um, we're just two peas in a pod. Oh, yeah. Pity, Pity the, the pod. pod. Uh-huh. <laughs> People send me two of hearts all the time. I get mm -hmm. that all the time. I mean, there's there's a lot of really great lines in it that um, have sort of stood the test of time. It's a true crime classic. Uh, and it, quite it, apart from being an amazing piece of writing. Well, interestingly, because Time Magazine just this week put me at number one of best true crime uh, novels of all time. I know Esquire had number just done this. One. Number one. Of course, had you done it 20 years earlier when the book came out, it might have sold a few copies. Well, how are the royalties? They are non-existent. <laughs> if you remember the the way it's structured, and I've tried to explain this to Michael, who doesn't believe that I didn't make millions off of it because I did not make millions off of it. <laughs> <laughs> the, you get your advance, yeah. right? And then you have to make back the advance. Yes. And then you start getting 10 cents on the dollar for the next right. thousand you copies. You recoup your royalty rate, which yeah. seems so unfair because the book people are getting their money back because they're getting most of the money in. Yeah. Every six months, I'll get a check in the mail and it will be like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I can't pay my phone bill and it will come and I'll be like, oh my God, thank God. How many, how many, I mean, are you, do you feel at liberty to reveal how many copies you sold? Uh, we're over a hundred thousand. James, I that's think so. amazing. Yeah, no, I think so. You haven't made any money? Well, no, but like I said, I make a little bit here and there. You weren't very happy though when it was renamed. No. <laughs> Changing an author's title is... It's it's heartbreaking when that happens. The other time you were furious, not to remind you, was when I wrote an introduction to the book. And like, James is so livid. You said that my apartment smelled like cat piss, which I was furious over. <laughs> what? Because I didn't have a cat. <laughs> oh, but why were you peeing in a litter box? Because it was a K-hole thing. <laughs> but he had litter in it. Litter. I didn't know there was no cat. Why? <laughs> Oh my God, I was furious. What, um, what was it like writing the book? Like, how was that? Because I remember you coming out to LA mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and after the whole murder had happened, but What's the story. Yeah, but the body hadn't washed up on shore yet, That's so right. Michael hadn't been arrested. So right. I was telling you everything before it actually, before right. things really shook out. That's right. We went to the Hollywood canteen mm -hmm. and we had dinner. And I mean, it was just to hear the stories because you were actually reluctant at first to talk about it. And you flat out refused to write about it. Aren't you glad we persuaded you to write it? Yes. And no. And yes. And no. I wanted to be a writer. And this ended up being my entree into right that but I didn't want to give Michael the satisfaction of having James St. James was writing about Michael so uh -huh. so the way I went around that was I said to you okay finally f it okay I'll do it but by God it is going to be all about me you showed Michael when he got released from prison the documentary and the movie tell, yeah. tell, talk about that it started off being you know he was came out of prison and he had never had an iPhone he'd never been on Google he'd never he'd never seen the internet before one of the things that we really were excited because he'd never seen he'd been hearing about it forever and ever and ever yeah. but he'd never seen it and he was furious about a number of things in the documentary <laughs> yes which he thinks that he he was trapped right and that you you tricked him and that he didn't say the things that he said which we have him on tape saying it's uh, a little trumpy isn't it, <laughs> it, it yes it, it was the beginning of what you see isn't really what what is happening there's a moment in the documentary where we're talking to him and he says i killed angel and and, and then he's like, oh, sorry, that was a joke. You know, that sort of thing that gets me into trouble. And he felt very strongly that we'd taken that moment out of context. But and you I can't was really... take anything out of context that isn't there. But I, I did question it and I went back and looked at the entire tape. It was not out of context at all. No, he just and, out of the blue did it. And it was kind of volunteered before yeah. the interview. It was almost like the first thing he said. Yeah. So I felt that actually made him look 
much better. Well, I, I don't am. know about that. But <laughs> him watching the movie was, I think it was that same sort of visceral reaction that I had that first time where seeing someone portray you is, it's a weird thing. And um, he did not like it and he was not happy with it. Because yeah, he also said, didn't he, that he felt the murder was misrepresented. Well, that's one of those things that we can go back and forth on till the end of time. No one is ever going to know what really happened in that room that day. What do you think about the way people react to the story? You know, on the one hand, there's a group of people who condemn the fact that it was made as a documentary and felt that the film celebrated it. But on the other hand... There is this devoted audience. Well, that's just it. I noticed at one point, I started noticing that the fans of my book and the movie were getting younger and younger. It was sort of a rite of passage for them. They didn't quite understand that it was um, a, a, uh, a cautionary what, tale. What, cautionary they, tale. This is not something you want. You don't want to be Michael or James, frankly. And so that's why I wrote Freak Show, was that I wanted to write a book for teenagers that had all the fabulous and the, the oh. funny club kid things, but didn't have the drugs and the murder. And Freak Show did really well. Freak Show got really amazing reviews, which Disco Bloodbath did not. It won a lot of awards, Texas School, Florida School, Library Awards, and this and that. So I was very happy with it. And do you have a, a new book in the works? Well, I mean, there's the one that we after the Killer Grandpa. Yeah, yeah. I really think when you feel comfortable, that well, is an I, amazing book. I um, need to go back a little further in time because I only go back to 1900. I need to go back a little further, <laughs> but I also need to go a little forward and do uh, my family now mm. and everything that's going kind of going on right now. Because in a nutshell, it's about a lynching in Florida in which your family was directly involved. Yes. And so it's this sort of legacy of, of a horrible uh, uh, story. There's, there's and... a legacy of, of how something like that can fester over generations and infect every generation after it because my family before that was a, um, a pioneer family in Florida, one of the first families in Fort Lauderdale. My uncle, when he was running for sheriff, <laughs> I don't even know. I'm be doing that. <laughs> but his posters around town said that he was the first white male child born in Fort Lauderdale, and that's why you should vote for him. That, like, right there tells you everything you need to know about where the story is going. Well, I think we're all seeing that racism is much more baked into the American experience and consciousness than I think we assumed e exactly. or believed. When you do that, come, come film. <laughs> you know, you said it was uh, uncomfortable and traumatic to see yourself played by someone else. I'm wondering in Party Monster, the documentary, how it was to see your previous self. Are you being masochistic here? Because you know <laughs> that that green light, I, I, to this day, I don't know why you would bring that up. I am just, it is maddening to me that you would be so cruel. I thought you were my friend. You lit me from behind with a gruesome, ghastly, sickly green light. And I was in the midst of a drug addiction. I was going bald and I had a magenta comb over. <laughs> um... I think we've covered this. We? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been... no, I, I, I just have to say I'm so glad you're still talking. To you <laughs> clearly, you have many grievances, <laughs> and I've done no. many injustices to you <laughs> over the years. Actually, it wasn't me; it was Randy. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it was all Randy. Get that green light. That was Randy's <laughs> idea. Uh, was it really thought out beforehand? The way you explained to me when the first time I exploded <laughs> was that it was like you were still like young filmmakers, yes. and you didn't realize that a green light would would cast such a horrible. <laughs> we've always liked the interviews to look different. You we gave Michael a rosy pink. <laughs> <laughs> we needed each interview to have a different color. Right. And by the time we hit you, it was <laughs> just going to be green. <laughs> and <laughs> you actually look pretty terrible. I did look the, bad. My, one of my favorite scenes actually in the in the dark is when you and Michael are cooking up K. I just think it's such a real scene. Right. And I, I mean, I think it shocks people. It fascinates people. It's also hilariously funny. It's like sort of train spotting comedy and I, I i thank you and michael for really letting us film it's one of those things where after 20 years with the documentary and after 15 years with the, the movie that there are i mean there are no hard feelings and in fact that's the thing that got us in trouble when we were doing the documentary was that michael and i were laughing about something yeah. we laugh at things now that are not funny but it's just it's a release valve but it's also it's enough time has passed that i don't need to cry every time somebody mentions the murder i mean i think it's slightly different for michael as opposed to you because you did not 
commit a murder. But there is a, there was a trauma. My world did fall apart, and mm. everything that I believed in was taken away from me. And I had believed that the club kids were this utopia, and that we were building a new world, and all that stuff ultimately turned out to be a lie. Oh, yeah. So you I know, was. I, I think it makes me think of Paul Morrissey, who I once interviewed long, long, long time ago. He said that you see the world as a toilet, and you try and create a utopia. Always what happens is you create a worse toilet. <laughs> <laughs> that was his whole... <laughs> well, I think a lot of times with, with, with Warhol and the Warhol scene, um, that it's the same thing with club, that's happening with the club kids now, is that they were all just nightmares and horrors and drug addicts and, and annoying speed freaks and everything. And you wouldn't want to spend any time with them. But over the course of 50 years, they, they're mythologized to a point where there's right. such glamour about them right. that didn't exist. Yes. And it's the same thing with the club kids. We do, you really didn't like to spend a lot of time with so many of them because they were annoying as fuck. The glamour accretes like a sort exactly. of like a yeah. pearl around a speck of dirt, <laughs> right? And on that note, I love you. I'm so grateful to you. Thank, thank you. you. Oh. <laughs> when was the last time you heard of a pea changing its pod? Well, at least he gave me something to write about. <laughs>